So, <clears throat> yeah, I've shown this slide before. So for a gamma camera, um, if we turn all the corrections off, then typically this is the image that we get if we put a uniform plane source on top of a gamma camera. And again, so that's what is often done in, in nuclear medicine. We have this uh, cobalt, what is it, 59 um, sources. They emit photons of 120 kilo electron volts, so close to technetium. And you can put them on the collimator or between two camera heads, and uh, then you can acquire a uniform image of that plane source. The manufacturer guarantees that it's uniform within, I think, 1% or something. That's one approach. The other approach is to move the collimator and put a point source at a sufficient distance from the gamma camera, and then you get an almost uniform image depending on how far the point source is. If it's not uniform, you can correct for the um, sensitivity profile that you get if that source is too close. So these are two ways to get uniform images and check if your camera indeed sees uniform images. And if you don't do any correction, it will not see uniform images. You see the photomultipliers popping up again. If you apply the energy correction, you get a very similar image, but now it's more similar everywhere but the photomultipliers are still there. And the problem is that the photomultipliers are actually, um, the, the, the performance, the, the, the estimate that you make of the position based on the photomultipliers is not linear. So if I linearly move the point source from left to right, then the image position of that point source will not nicely move with the true position. It will move a bit faster towards the photomultiplier and then hang around here and then later catch up. So this is not uh, a multiplicative problem. This is a deformation problem. Consequently, if we apply the linearity correction and move every photon to where it should be, uh, accounting for the nonlinear behavior of these photomultipliers, then we should get a uniform image. And that means if you put a line source here, it will not look like a straight line here, but after the linearity correction, it will look like a straight line. And then in principle, you could stop here, but to be sure, all vendors apply an additional flood correction, which is uh, produced by measuring an image like this, but measuring very long, such that we uh, don't have an important noise contribution. Um, and then you just assume that that is a uniform image. So you, you correct by multiplying with the mean of that image and dividing pixel by pixel uh, with, with that image. So again, uh, sorry, I've said that before, you should be careful. The flood correction will hide anything in subsequent flood measurements. And flood measurements are often used to check if the camera is okay. So you must make sure that when you acquire the flood correction, the camera is actually okay. Because suppose you turn off the linearity, you will get an ugly image like this that you should definitely not use in the clinic. If I define a flood correction on this one and I apply it, then the, by construction, that image will be uniform. And then it looks okay, but it isn't okay. So the flood correction should almost do nothing. If you see a lot of information in a flood correction image, there's something wrong with your camera camera. This is different for the PET in, a, in a PET does the normalization, which is basically the equivalent of the flood correction in SPECT. So it looks at the measurement and corrects for position dependent sensitivities. But in PET, we know that the sensitivity along the lines of response is not uniform at all. It's very dependent on the position. The reason is that the crystals come in blocks in that the performance of a crystal in the center of a block is always different from that at the edge. And you see that here, so this is a sinogram. And if you take a line through the sinogram, you get a parallel projection. In this case, parallel projection of an imaginary uniform object. And you see it's not uniform at all. You, you see a pattern and that pattern corresponds to the crystal blocks. In addition, there is one that has a problem here. And you see that that produces white line in the sinogram. So typically you see this stuff better in the sinogram. So for quality control, sinograms are actually often more useful than fuse. If you then apply normalization correction to this, then you should get an almost uniform sinogram. Um, very little errors like this, especially because it's a cold one. So the, in this case, white means low photons. You can live with that. You can scan it and still get, uh, scan with it and still get quantitative images. But if 
if uh, an entire block would be out, you will get a, a big white line here, then you should uh, replace it perfectly. So if you see something like this, and in the end we decide that that thing should be replaced, we just wait till the next maintenance and then have to replace it. All right. <clears throat> so here is a list of what you should do with a gamma camera, and all that is described in detail in, in, um, in NEMA protocols. So a gamma camera is often used for planar imaging. And in that case, we must be sure that a uniform image, uh, sorry, a uniform phantom is imaged as a uniform image. Um, the energy resolution has been specified and you can check it. And so this kind of test is something that you would typically do when you buy a new gamma camera and you want to check that the machine arrives in excellent condition which it usually does. But in addition, it's still useful to do that measurement even if you know the camera is gonna succeed because it produces a, a reference value that you can compare with uh, at data stages when you do the test again on our camera. So you can measure the energy resolution, you can measure the linearity, which you can do with a, a phantom that has linear structures. So either line source that you move over the scanner, but that's very time consuming, or you take a big LED plate with slits and you uh, image that plate with uh, a uniform source or with port source from a distance. And you check if that is linear and there is software on the, on the cameras provided by the vendors to check the linearity of certain images. You can check the spatial resolution, which obviously depends on the collimator. So it's a combination of the intrinsic resolution and the collimator resolution, and it changes with distance. So, but if you put the source at a predefined distance, do the measurement, you should um, get the result that the, the company guarantees. You can measure the dead time, um, the sensitivity, again, that depends on the collimator and the pixel size. So all of this should in principle not change. So if your camera is in good condition, and uh, then the next day, if it still is in good condition, not, nothing of this will have changed. One reason to do some of these measurements is when photomultipliers have to be replaced. Or otherwise, um, it is done typically once a year to, to completely check the system. But um, the uniformity, for example, is something that is done uh, daily because it gives you a very good idea of the global condition of the camera. So typically in the morning, they would quickly do uniformity test. If the uniformity test is fine, we know the gamma camera is almost certainly okay. If it's not okay, then we have to do additional tests to figure out what's going on. You yeah. What you mean by the pixel size? Uh, the pixel size, um, you want to have that correct if you draw a region and you determine volumes, you, you want those to be correct. So if you put, uh, two point sources at a known distance from each other, you make an image and you measure in the image, the distance that should be the correct distance. And um, yeah, in the beginning of my career, the cameras were very analog. So there was a lot of, of uh, analog image processing with amplifiers and all that. And that the, um, the specifications of all that circuitry in combination with the photomultipliers can gradually change and that would affect the pixel size. These days, everything is discretized very early in the front end electronics. So the chances of having pixel issues is much smaller now. But still, if the, the high voltage would change, then the performance of the photomultipliers would change, that would affect the pixel size. But you would see it not by measuring the pixel size, but because the uniform image is no longer uniform. But still, it's good to know that this matters. So if, if a big revision happens to your scanner, it's a good idea to check the pixel size. Also, uh, typically we have dual head systems and you take uh, images from both sides and in planar imaging, uh, very often one multiplies these images and takes the square root because that reduces the effect of attenuation, right? Because it's something inside the patient would move from the back to the front. You would see more and more photos in the front and fewer and fewer photos in the back. If you multiply the two images, there would be less effect. Right? But Multiplying those images is only uh, correct if they nicely correspond pixel to pixel. So even a small change in the pixel size could actually reduce the quality of that production. So that again is important to check the pixel size is correct and also the alignment of those two images is correct. 
Okay. Now suppose that all that is fine. Then if you want to do whole body imaging, then still there are things that need to be checked that are not included here. So whole body imaging means that you put the patient on the scanner and then uh, either the patient is moved with bed and everything along the scanner that happens severely, more typically the scanner, the, the two detector heads move along the patient. Um, actually, I'm not sure that's more typical. Um, well, both exist. Now, I think actually most of the time the patient is moved, but uh, there are scanners that move heads. Um, and so the, the, it, normally it's a continuous motion, so which is more comfortable for the patient, and the whole thing is acquired in one big image. But of course, that requires that the bed motion is um, perfectly operated as it should, such that the relation between pixel size and motion of the bed is correct. Because the patient is moved, that moves the, what is acquired to a different position in the global acquisition image. So if there is anything wrong to the speed of the bed, then there will be a deformation of that image. Again, in the past, this was important. For this to happen now is very unlikely. Uh, and these, these bed motors are these days very good. So they, they are stepper motors and they typically have a feedback mechanism. So they, they tell the bed move to that position and then it is verified with an independent measurement if the bed is really there. So the chances that this could go wrong are pretty small these days, but it still could go wrong. So it's still a good idea to check it. In particular, if you buy a new system, they all come with new weaknesses and strengths. And so it's a good idea to learn to know your system. And if you discover that this is a weakness of the system, you have to measure it more often. It is in principle possible that the planar uniformity is fine and the whole body uniformity is not fine. And the, again, that would be to problems with the bed motion. If the bed would somehow move irregularly, the speed is not constant or whatever, then that would, could create non-uniformities. Actually, I've never seen it, but in theory, it could happen. And similar, the pixel size can be affected. If there is something wrong with the bed motion, then the pixel size in the direction of the bed motion could be affected, while the pixel size perpendicular to it would still be unaffected. So checking the pixel size in whole body is meaningful. Again, this is typically not what you should do every day, but it is definitely useful to do it um, when you buy a new scanner and then as a yearly maintenance. Then for spec, so if a scanner meets all that, it can still be uh, have problems with spec. And the most important are these three, or these two actually, the center of rotation, which I will explain better in the, in the next slide and then the relative position of the detectors. And so in, again, it's better these days. So I, we have had the hospital that really struggled with that center of rotation that needed uh, frequent recalibration to get this right. So um, here is the center of rotation. I will do that first. Um, so if, if I put a point source exactly in the middle, you would expect the sinogram to look like this. Um, and the reason is that you assume that the center will project exactly in the middle of each sinogram row and therefore it will be the same everywhere. But in principle, it, well, it doesn't have to be like that because the, the position the, of the rotation axis is a mechanical thing. And where exactly that projects in your sinogram is a combination of the electronics discretization and the software that actually puts it in the image. And they don't necessarily have to be synchronized. And as I just said, in some of the gamma cameras we have seen, that was definitely a weakness. And then you would get a result like that. So um, the gamma camera would be here, would rotate, and because this thing is really on the rotation axis, the projection would always be at the same position in the camera. But it could be that that camera actually stores that uh, signal, not in the center of the row, but a bit to the right as shown here. That's perfectly fine. Then you would get that line, not in the center, but at a small shift. However, during reconstruction, we have to tell the reconstruction software that the rotation axis projected here. Then everything is fine, we can account for it. But if we then assume, which is typically done in, in the reconstruction software, that the rotation axis projects in the, in the center, then we have a problem. 
And so and that's the center of rotation problem, which is that the direction of the center of rotation axis is not exactly where it is supposed to be. So suppose you get a sinogram like this, where the rotation axis is actually a bit to the left. Then the reconstruction program needs to find an activity distribution, which is such that from whatever side you look at it, it's always a bit at the right of the center. That's clearly impossible because if I move, if I look from here and it look is at the right, and if I go 180 degrees at the other side, it should be at the left. So there is no such object. And as a result, the reconstruction software will make wonderful artifacts. And so you get, uh, for 180 degrees acquisition, you immediately see the effect, you get horrible reconstructions. And so the, um, what basically happens is, well, if you draw it, um, I'll try to draw it, uh, the center is here. So ideally we should have this. Now suppose that there is a small offset with the electronics and the thing is projected here, but the, the reconstruction software doesn't know it. So you will get the back projection line here. And you will also get the back projection line in here, and here, and here, and here. And so this line, tangent to all these back projection lines, will see a lot of activity. And that's what you uh, see here. So this line is, oh, this line is, is tangent to all these back projection lines. And then um, if you look at neighboring lines, then they will see too much activity. And that's why some negatives are put here to partly compensate for the excess positive activity that was needed to make those lines happy. So the whole thing is crappy. And if you forward project it, you don't get this, but you get a, a reasonable approximation of it. But it's impossible to get this design. I'm simply inconsistent. There is no object that can produce a signing like that. So you see the effect immediately like this. And I've seen cases where, for example, the cardiac scan scanning over 180 degrees. If you then look at the heart, you, you see effects like that, where the apex has been deformed and you see negatives and positive. But if you acquire over 360 degrees, then you don't see that effect. The effect is then just simply blurring. And you can imagine that if you would scan over 360 degrees, you would get another contribution similar to this, but flipped. Uh, vertically, and if you add those, then you will get a simply blurred image. And so that means if you do like in brain scanning 180 degrees acquisitions, you, your image will look blurrier, but if you don't look closely, you will not see. Which again, emphasizes the need to do at least every now and then a scan to check if your scanner is still all right, because some, are, some effects can distort your image but it's not so obvious that you would immediately see it if you take a quick look at the reconstruction after the acquisition of the scan. All right, I skipped this one, which is pretty straightforward. So um, if you want to measure the dead time, again, something you typically don't do every day because it would be hard for the scanner to have it changed unless something was really wrong. But you want to know the dead time um, of, the, of a new scanner and you want to check it every year. So the, the most straightforward way to measure it is to fill a phantom with so much radioactivity that your scanner has a significant dead time. And then you put it in front of your scanner and you start scanning. And you scan over several half-lives. And you design the amount of software of radioactivity such that after a few half-lives, you have reason to believe that the time will be very small. So then you acquire basically the yellow curve here. So when you start, you're here lots of activity and you have a significant dead time. And as a result, you underestimate true activity would be, which would be the dashed line. And when the activity decays, you go back here and if it decays sufficiently, then the dead time is zero and you basically scanning along the ideal straight line. Okay, so this is the um, true activity, the x-axis and the y-axis is the measured activity. It should, should be the identity of course. Now, the drawback of that is that you put a lot of activity in it. And, and uh, 
you get irradiated by that, but it's hard to avoid with uh, the time measurements. The other drawback is that this takes very long. So you, you need to scan several half-lives and all the time you're scanning stuff. So a simpler way to do the same is to work with two sources. And you select the sources such that if you put both uh, sources on the scanner, that you have significant data. So I fill two sources with almost the same activity. I put one on the scanner and I get one of these points. Uh, yeah, so I put one on the scanner and I get this point. Then I put the other one, I get that point, and then I take, it away, take away the first one, and I get this point. So that minimizes my interaction with these sources and it produces two points on this curve. And because we, as I explained in the past, we assume that this is a, uh, basically an exponential. Uh, you, you can determine the dead time from this. There's only one parameter, which is the dead time. And so two points is enough. The reason to make that activity almost the same is that then the expression is much simpler. Because actually, if you don't make it the same, you, you have three points, which, which would probably be better. But then the calculations are a bit more complicated. Well, then, uh, if you do that center of rotation correction, most companies in their um, prescription of how to do the test, they recommend to put the point source in the middle, which is close to the rotation axis. And to determine the center of rotation problem, that's just fine. But there is another possible problem that the detector can have, and that problem is more likely to occur if you have a more flexible gamma camera. So some gamma cameras are really dedicated to spec. And if they do that, they tend to fix them in, in a position, uh, making sure that when you do a spec scan, the, the detector is nicely parallel to the rotation axis. But other gamma cameras are designed for flexibility because you want to do planar imaging with it. You want to scan legs, feet, uh, and all that. Um, and those cameras are extremely flexible. And the drawback of all that flexibility is that maybe they don't return exactly to the position that you want for spec. And so suppose a gamma camera is slightly off, so it, it has a small angle with the rotation axis. Suppose I put a point source here, then that point source would project up here when the gamma camera is here. But when the gamma camera is on the other side, it would go here. So if I make a movie of my projections, if I look through the projections, I would see this point source go up and down. In a parallel projection, that shouldn't happen. It should always be at the same level. So if you see it going up and down, your gamma camera clearly has a problem. Now, if you put the point source in the middle, as often recommended, you don't have the effect, then it always projects at the same position. So actually, I would prefer to put it offline. I think the center of rotation still works. And in addition, you check that detector position. If you want to really make the company happy, you can put it there and then do another measurement with the, the point source uh, away from the rotation axis to make sure that you also see this effect. If you see that, you almost certainly have to call the company. They will have to make sure that when you tell the gamma camera to go to spec position, it, it is at the right angle. 